percent of their living donor uh, kidney transplant are done through paired exchange. Uh, Switzerland was the first European country that had paired exchange in 1999 and so forth. Uh, Netherlands has the first national KPD program and Spain started in 2009. Uh, in Europe, there was a lot of legal barriers. For example, in France and Germany, uh, living kidney donation was only uh, uh, allowed uh, in, in uh, related donors. If you're not biologically related to your recipient, you are not allowed to, to donate. Those laws have been changed, have been actually uh, uh, challenged, and now there are less legal barriers. And then so forth, Australia around 2007. So you can see here uh, around that period of, uh, of time where uh, a lot of countries started uh, with paired exchange. In the United States, there was actually an issue uh, because kidney donation, uh, kidney pair donation was, uh, was viewed as potentially could be a valuable consideration. You know, the law in, in the US in 1984 called the National Organ Transplant Act made it illegal to buy or sell human organs and says it is or it shall be unlawful for any person to knowingly acquire receive or otherwise transfer any human organ for valuable consideration, meaning in exchange of money, uh, for use in human transplantation. So the interpretation of the law was very, uh, uh, was, was challenged because it wasn't clear whether paired exchange is considered valuable consideration or uh, was it actually considered a gift. So a lot of hospitals were wary about doing uh, paired kidney exchange, but our medical societies here in the US uh, and conferences in early 2000s started to discuss, you know, the eth ethical and legal uh, implication of KPD. The argument was this can address a severe uh, shortage of kidneys in the US. And the Congress made an amendment to the law in 2007. And actually they added a sentence that the preceding sentence does not apply with respect to human organ pair donation. And that actually in 2007, that allowed the hospitals to, uh, to start doing paired kidney exchange. Uh, actually paired kidney exchange was considered a gift rather than a consideration. As you can see here in many countries around the world now, most, trans, most uh, uh, countries including Netherlands, UK, Canada, Australia, most of their uh, programs actually include KPDs. Uh, some of them have national uh, kidney paired uh, donation programs. So what are the benefits of those programs, KPD, of course, uh, when you put pairs in a, in a kidney paired exchange program, you aspire to get better matches, better HLA matches, better ABO matches, so you don't have to do uh, ABO compatible or positive cross match kidneys. And as you know, that allow people to have more living donor transplant. As, as you know, living uh, donor transplantation is better and allow better allograft survival uh, than uh, having kidney from a deceased donor. And of course, less waiting time. People do not have to uh, wait years and years to get a deceased donor. For example, here in Minnesota and the upper Midwest in the US, uh, the waiting time for blood type O can be five to six years. Blood type A is around three to four years. So, and those waiting time are increasing as we speak. Also, it allows the chance to have a preemptive transplant. That's before uh, undergoing dialysis. And as you know, dialysis, uh, uh, it's a marker and uh, people who were previously on dialysis have less uh, success with kidney transplant and uh, their outcomes are uh, worse in general. Also, when you include uh, pairs in KPD programs, you avoid age and body size discrepancy. You can pick uh, a donor and match uh, a younger donor with a younger recipient and vice versa. And avoid as well CMV and EBV mismatch. And that can, 
can be actually a serious uh, problem uh, in certain patients. For example, bone marrow transplant patient who needs a kidney. If you avoid any of those uh, CMV and EBV, you save them a lot for the future and uh, their outcomes would be better. So what do we consider when we do KPD? It's similar to any uh, direct donation, direct transplant. We respect the ABO blood type. Uh, there is possibility to combine ABO and K uh, incompatibility in KPD. It's less and less done. I mean, the reason we include uh, pairs in, uh, in KPD programs is to avoid ABO incompatibility, but sometimes you have to also uh, combine those uh, in order to have uh, an offer for your patient. Uh, we respect HLA matching. Uh, can avoid uh, transplanting a patient um, a recipient that has donor specific antibodies to the respective uh, donor. Uh, you can actually uh, do a better match, especially matching on class two HLA antigens, which we know uh, portend better uh, outcomes for, for, for the future. And of, of course, avoiding positive uh, cross match. And that can allow also highly sensitized patients to have access to transplant. Those patients who are highly sensitized tend to uh, remain on the waiting list for a long time. And some of them may not even get offered any uh, kidneys. So in its simplest form, that's actually a two-way uh, exchange. It's, uh, you have a donor, uh, one and recipient. This is a pair and that's another pair. Uh, they're uh, ABO incompatible, B2A. So instead of uh, uh, doing actually that transplant, which is can be, uh, uh, cannot be done B2A. So you, you just simply exchange kidneys. That's the simplest form of, uh, of uh, KPD exchange. And you can actually be more uh, uh, innovative and add pairs to that uh, who have positive cross match and so forth. So you have, uh, you have several options. That's a two way. We call those closed loops because it's just exchanges can, uh, can go up to four way loops and can actually even go to more than that. But what's more innovative these days, and that's how, uh, how things are progressing here in the US, is the use of non-directed donors. Those are donors who want to donate to anyone. So instead of having a valuable O non-directed donor go to the waiting list and benefit only one patient, we actually use those donors to trigger chains. So that uh, non-directed donor is start a chain and so forth, as you can see here, uh, non-directed donor uh, start a chain. And the last donor the, in that chain from the last pair may be hard to match. Uh, could be an AB donor, that donor can go to the waiting list. So benefit someone on the waiting list who doesn't have any potential donor or can, or that donor can become what we call a bridge donor. So it bridge to uh, another, uh, another chain uh, and, the, and so forth. You can have more and more uh, transplants. That's the first publication in the US. Actually, it started uh, just when the when KPD became legal in the US and acceptable. Uh, as you can see here, uh, across many states, it started in July 2007. You can do those transplant. You don't have to do them same day. Uh, actually, it spent from July 2007 till March uh, 2008 across several states from Arizona, Ohio, Maryland, North Carolina where kidneys, you know, uh, traveled uh, an O donor started, an undirected donor started the chain and so forth. And the last um, donor probably was a bridge donor who is AB, it was hard to, uh, to match, probably went to a waiting list. Uh, very rarely those donors would actually start chains because it's very hard to have, uh, to match AB donors. And that's another publication showing the value of non-directed donors, NDDs. Uh, 77 NDDs less, led actually to 373 transplantation. Instead of those 77 uh, triggering only 77 transplant, if they go to the waiting list, they actually, that helped us uh, doing 296 uh, more transplant than they would have if they 
directly donated to one recipient or donated to the waiting list. So uh, at Mayo Clinic, we have on average 10 to 15 non-directed donors here in the site in Minnesota, the Rochester site. Uh, they're very valuable. If they're blood type O, we actually put them in chains. Uh, I will talk about that in a minute. As you can see, uh, this is becoming more and more popular in the US, around 150 to 200 uh, NDD become available in the US. So we talked about non-directed donors triggering chains. Uh, we talked about the bridge donor at the end of the chain or the donor that actually donate to the waiting list. But what's more innovative is the use of compatible pairs. So why it is important? I think, you know, this is very important. If you have a compatible pairs, you can um, talk to them about potentially helping other people. We tell them you can help uh, triggering chains and benefit all recipients on the, uh, on the KPD program that do not have any O donors. So making the rare O donors more accessible to them and benefits pairs who have an AB donor who only donate to an AB recipient. And of course, the highly sensitized candidates are always a winner in KPD programs. Now, not everything is, uh, is great because there are some disadvantages. There are a lot of challenges uh, for KPD. Um, here, the good thing in our internal program in the three sites, we know each other. We know the transplant surgeon each site. Um, but you know, when you do a paired kidney exchange across a large country like the US, so you may have actually some, some issues. A lot of times we encounter some technical difficulties. If uh, surgery get delayed, donor surgery in one center that influence the other centers waiting for the kidney. Um, here, kidneys are uh, flown through commercial flights in the US and you know, uh, they're could be cancellations of those flights. There are weather conditions. Sometimes we're exposed with an expected positive final cross match or last minute donor or recipient illness, and that happens. The good thing, most of the time we have leverage to um, repair those chains, especially when we, do, we don't do them same day. This is why it is important in those KPD programs uh, and KPD runs and KPD uh, um, uh, exchanges to actually not to do the transplant at the same time. So you avoid having that last minute issue. There is some small risk of the donor changing their mind, reneging on the donor. I mean, we've seen that happen. Uh, the bridge donor uh, sometimes uh, change their mind and they don't go with the donation. It happens, but very, very rarely. I mean, when we talk about KPD, I want to give you an idea about uh, the largest pairing uh, organization in the US called National Kidney Registry. It's a non-governmental agency. It's actually a nonprofit uh, that was established by, uh, by a couple who had uh, their daughter who was 10 year old who needed a kidney transplant and they were incompatible, blood, blood incompatible with her and they established National Kidney Registry or NKR. So it was founded in 2007 after the uh, per kidney exchange became legal in the US. Uh, most, uh, there are about 90 uh, transplant centers. Most of them are the largest centers, the largest academic centers in the US participate in NKR. Uh, in 2014, they celebrated their 1,000 arranged transplants, and uh, in November, as of November 30th, they facilitated 4,464 transplants. So that's actually a great number of transplants that happen through exchange. Um, NKR is good because they allow centers to express their preferences. When you uh, participate in NKR, it's a large pool of uh, donors and recipients, so you can actually set up your expectation, the maximum donor age, uh, donor weight. You can actually even say you, you don't want to ship a kidney across the US for more than many hours or so. Uh, avoid 
avoidance of EBV and CMV mismatches. So that's that's a really a good perk about NKR. Um, they don't charge the patients. Typically, the transplant center um, pay a fee. They call it an operational fee for for facilitating the the exchange. About five thousand dollar per transplant, which is considered not a large sum of money in the U.S. The good thing, the highlights of this uh, this organization called NKR National Kidney Registry, they're very regimented. They dictate the timetable. They actually take care of all the logistical plans. Uh, they put GPS on kidneys so you can track them through commercial flights. They have very strict guidelines. If uh, if something happened in one center, they can repair the uh, repair the chain very efficiently because they have a lot uh, of uh, of. Uh, of pairs, as I said, there are 90 transplant center participating in NKR. Uh, they're becoming more innovative. They do also uh, use compatible donors. And uh, in 2012, they started the program called Advanced Donation, meaning you can donate on behalf of your uh, recipient uh, with with the uh, promise that your recipient will get a kidney in the future when they need a kidney. Also, there are the voucher donations. Actually, you can donate today. And in, if in 10 years, one of your family members need a kidney, you can designate uh, that. So they're bec becoming more and more innovative. The highlights of that NKR is that they're very efficient in organizing uh, logistics. And they publish their uh, outcomes. Um, and as you can see here, they facilitate more highly sensitized patients, more retransplants. Uh, those are patients who are, are usually sensitized and have issues and uh, they facilitate actually uh, also transplant for patients who have long vintage of dialysis. So after the highlights that I gave you about the largest pairing organization NKR, uh, I, I feel that I should talk to you about uh, desensitization uh, as compared to KPD for the highly sensitized candidates. Uh, there's no talk about KPD without talking about desensitization. So if you have actually a pair or um, someone who needs a kidney transplant, they have a donor who's, and that donor is immunologically incompatible with them. What are the options that you have? You can desensitize, directly desensitize, meaning, you know, uh, lower the antibody burden in the recipient so can do the transplant. Uh, you can enroll that pair in um, a KPD program, or you can do a hybrid approach, combination of both, paired exchange and desensitization. So what is desensitization? It's offering a treatment, pre-transplantation to the recipient to lower anti-donor antibodies. Um, it may work, it may not work. Uh, logistically complicated, involve a lot of plasma pheresis, VIG, uh, name it, rituximab, bortezumab, so many medications in order to get uh, the recipient ready to receive the kidney uh, from that donor whom they're incompatible with. And in general, you use more intense immunosuppression, a pre-transplant when you're preparing the donor for, uh, sorry, the recipient for the uh, transplant. And after that, um, and also you need to do a lot of testing, frequent biopsies, DSA monitoring, blood work. Uh, so it's more cumbersome than just a, 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 a donation without issues, uh, without uh, uh, desensitization. There is very high cost associated with desensitization. Um, more risk for infections, you need to put the dialysis catheter in order to do uh, plexing. Uh, uh, there are some issues with uh, hypercoagulability. Sometimes if you do the transplant against HLA, um, incompatibility, uh, you may need to do more. Uh, could be a rescue splenectomy before, uh, after the transplant or even the, before the transplant. And you need to have really a solid uh, 
center to do uh, desensitization and to do positive cross match kidney. You need very experienced HLA lab personnel, pathologist, who is your biopsies, pharmacist, who help you as well with the with the medications. And the problem there is uh, non standardized desensitization protocols. Uh, Mayo Clinic has its own protocol. Mount Sinai in the U.S. John Hopkins had their, their own protocol. So each center has their own uh, protocol of desensitization. And uh, so there's no standard uh, to use in everyone. We talked about the challenges, more infections, um, and we talked about that desensitization at time may not work. And even with desensitization, sometimes uh, you may not actually uh, even get to transplant that patient. The patient may remain actually, especially if they have class two HLA antibodies, uh, DQ, anti-DQ or DR, they may be hard to, to remove and it's very difficult to match, uh, to find a match for uh, or to, uh, to achieve a negative cross match. And even with this is actually a publication from our group showing with positive cross match, even thus after desensitization, you have lower patient survival and lower graft survival. Even with the best desensitization in the world, the outcomes with the positive cross match become uh, actually remain uh, bad. So, what's better alternative to desensitization? I think kidney pair donation or kidney pair exchange. I think it's the answer because you know you can have access to more potential uh, and compatible donors. And why it is different from desensitization, instead of modifying the recipient, hammering the recipients by desensitization with giving them a lot of medications, KPD alters the donor. Just you exchange the live donor with a more compatible one without going through a cumbersome desensitization that may work or may not work. So I feel that KPD is actually a good option for someone who's highly sensitized or someone who has a donor whom uh, they have antibodies against or DSA against. Now we'll talk about our uh, 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 internal KPD program. You know, Mayo Clinic has three locations, one in the upper Midwest where I am now in Rochester, Minnesota, and we have two other uh, large kidney transplant programs and presence in Florida and Arizona. Uh, combined with the largest kidney transplant program in the US, actually the three centers combined, we do between 800 to 1000 kidney transplant a year. And that allow us actually to have a, an active internal kidney per do donation program. Uh, being uh, three sites, same transplant, we're considered same transplant, we have the same standard uh, we have the same protocols, uh, so we all talk the same language. We have the same um, health record system. We actually meet on a weekly basis to discuss uh, KPD among the three sites. So how, is, how do we approach uh, uh, tra kidney transplantation at the Mayo Clinic? All pairs are potential KPD candidates. We actually uh, foster it. And, we foster the education. Um, we foster it. Actually, we give them a lot of education before they come for their appointment. Uh, we send flyers when we talk as well uh, to those patients and their uh, potential donors before they come for their evaluation. We always include information about KPD. So. What we became more known for is that we enroll compatible pairs. And why is that? It's not only to facilitate more transplant. Of course, we can do more transplant when we have more pairs that are included uh, in the pool of, uh, of uh, KPD. Uh, but, you know, as I said before, we benefit our O recipients who have non-O donors, uh, helps our highly sensitized recipients and also better matching, especially for class two, that is very important. And we can avoid EBV and CMV mismatches. Uh, we can also, uh, with our pool of, uh, of pairs, we can also uh, look for better age and size matching for the recipient that we have and uh, put the best donors with the, with, with the, with the recipients. 
Sometimes we are a little bit more innovative than other centers. We combine KPD with positive cross match, low positive flow cross match, or DSA. If uh, we look at uh, when we run the matches, we uh, if someone is very highly sensitized, they have broad sensitization against class one and class two HLA antigens. If, for example, they have low level uh, class one. Uh, we may actually proceed with the transplant. We know it's not as uh, as a risk taking when we do that, and sometimes we do also desensitization with uh, within KPD. It's very rare that we do that, but typically uh, we can combine all those in order to get our patient transplanted. That's actually uh, some highlight about our program. Uh, so when the law became, uh, when it became legal to do KPD in 2007, there was only two-way exchange, two pairs participated in Minnesota, they, two, spa, two couples swapped kidneys, but it became actually more uh, established in 2009, um, where uh, Arizona joined us, and thereafter, since then, we've been doing more and more transplants. So far, actually, a few days ago, we have facilitated 555 kidney transplant since 2009. Uh, this year, uh, despite the pandemic, we have done 98 transplant through, uh, uh, through November 24, 2020. Uh, I just got that information a few days ago. So almost 100 transplant despite all the pandemic, the cancellation of flights or those among the three centers. Uh, we're considered one of the busiest internal KPD program in the US. As I said, we combined, uh, we combine as well low flow, uh, positive cross match, and sometimes we accept a little bit higher risk in order to get the transplant. And how we do things, we have a dedicated team. Uh, the, we have a one nurse coordinator. It's typically a living donor coordinator in each site. They talk to each other. We have one to two transplant nephrologists. I'm one of them here in Rochester. I have my colleague, Dr. Shinstock, who's also uh, um, helping in KPD here. Uh, we have one dedicated transplant surgeon and we have a dedicated HLA lab personnel on each side that they're really, really important to us in understanding you know, the donor specific antibodies and picking the best, uh, the best uh, donors and uh, matching them with the recipients. We meet on weekly basis. Uh, every Thursday, actually, we meet like today. After at the, we meet for uh, an hour. Sometimes uh, we discuss all the new pairs that we include and we discuss all the logistics um, and all the uh, arranging all the logistics between the three sites in Arizona, Minnesota, and, and uh, Florida. So we wanted to look at our uh, experience. We published that uh, last year, uh, our 10 year anniversary of doing uh, KPD. As I said, now we have more, but this is uh, this publication was uh, in 332 kidney transplant that were facilitated by our KPD programs. 54 ABO HLA compatible pairs participated in KPD between September 2007 to early June 2018. Our goals was not actually to just look at our experience because we know about it. It's just to see whether uh, we're benefiting the recipients of those 54 uh, ABO and HLA compatible pairs. You know, we put those pairs, they're compatible, so they can do the transplant directly, but we wanted to make sure we're not disadvantaging them. And we, uh, the other goal is to determine the factors associated with prolonged KPD waiting times. So for the whole cohort, the medium time to uh, transplantation from the entry, from enrolling them in KPD was about 89 days, about three months, ranged between 42 days to 187 days. Most of the uh, recipients that waited actually to get matched are those who are highly sensitized, we had positive uh, cross match uh, with some uh, when we do the match run, uh, so we did not do the transplant. So, and some, some, some of those were also uh, recipients who have blood type O. 
And we showed that recipient blood type O and uh, high PRA of more than 98% or equal to 98% were associated with uh, waiting more than three months to uh, receive a kidney transplant after KPD enrollment. So what are the reasons for um, incorporating those compatible pairs in KPD? Altruistic reasons, about 20%, 11 out of those 54 pairs who just wanted to help other people. They heard it in the news. We also, as I said, we educate them about that. We tell them you have an O donor. If you participate in uh, KPD, you may help, you know, another five or six pairs to get transplant and they become excited about it. So for pure altruistic reason, about 20%. For size A's mis mismatch, about half, half of the those pairs. And for EBV mismatch, about 9%. And for CMV mismatch, about 19%. Per, about 19%. And what we showed, this is busy, but I will summarize it. What we showed that most pairs, com compatible pairs actually derive benefit from KPD. We were not disadvantaging those recipients or those pairs. Uh, they can wait if there are no constraints of dialysis or not, the recipient is not on dialysis or on the verge of starting dialysis. Uh, if they can wait another 30 days to get the transplant or two months or three months, or they can score better kidney, where we can avoid also CMV and EBV mismatches. We avoided it in 90% of the cases for CMV mismatch and about 100% for EBV mismatch. Most of the EBV mismatches, the recipients who are uh, younger, so someone who's 20, 21, who's EBV naive and their, uh, their donor is EBV positive, we worry about PTLD in the future. Um, with their uh, with their transplant, so we could achieve actually in hundred percent of those cases we could achieve an EBV negative uh, uh, donor for them. Even those who were actually entered for altruistic reason, they actually received the kidneys better uh, uh, kidneys from better donors. Better meaning uh, younger in age better in clearance, better, um, and that's that's a benefit. That's a benefit for those recipients. Uh, for those compatible pairs, the mean time, um, or the median time to transplant from KPD was about 70 days. So if they derive some benefits, why not waiting 70 days uh, to, to, to do uh, the transplant when you get actually a younger donor, you get a CMV negative donor or an EBV negative donors. <clears throat> and most of those, almost half of those transplants were done preemptively. Sorry. So we showed that those recipients who are compatible with their donors, they derive benefit from entering the KPD program. I will walk you through this guideline for KPD enrollment. So we recommend actually that all recipients and potential donors be educated about KPD. That's during the initial face-to-face -face evaluation. Also, we send them um, handouts. We talk about KPD all the time. Actually, some of uh, my experience when I see some donors and recipients, they bring it up like we're in the middle of the uh, clinic encounter and they actually ask me about KPD and they're excited about it because we actually start the education early on and that's very, very important. Um, for all incompatible uh, uh, pairs, we uh, enter them into the KPD program. For those who are compatible, we look at the following. Do they have CMV mismatch? Will they benefit the recipient? Will the recipient benefit if he had CMV negative kidney, EBV negative kidney? Uh, we look at age mismatches. If you have a 20 year old whose donor is 70 or 60, you know, it's better for that 20 year old to get um, a younger kidney and the other pair will benefit from getting a compatible kidney and the kidney that they don't have DSA against. Size mismatch. Um, it's important. Uh, also, for a lot of uh, 
patients are retransplants. If we avoid actually uh, mismatches, especially for class two, we help them uh, get a better uh, outcome in the future. Now, <clears throat> if they're not interested, of course, um, we remove them from KPD or we don't enroll them. And always, always, if there is a problem, uh, for example, if there is time constraint that uh, that recipient is on the verge of starting dialysis, we remove them from KPD and we go with transplant from, from the original donor. So it's a very dynamic process. So it's not set in stone. We, uh, we keep looking at the pairs actually on, uh, on weekly basis as a group, as a team, and we have the coordinators looking at them on daily basis. Each time we approve someone for transplant and we approve their donors, we actually put them in the KPD without their knowledge, just to see if there is any, anything we can do to help them have better access to transplant. This is our KPD protocol. Uh, it's not as complicated as it looks. So for all uh, ABO and HLA incompatible pairs, we strongly recommend enrollment in KPD. And if in three months they don't score any kidney, we actually give them the option to go to NKR, to the national program, uh, where they can get exposed to a larger pool, where they can have better chance in getting kidney, especially for the highly sensitized patients. Um, for the ABO compatible uh, pairs, uh, we look actually at their original donor and we see if there is, as I said, if there's CMV mismatch, EBV mismatch. Uh, and at times actually we don't really routinely, uh, routinely uh, calculate uh, the living donor KDPI. As you know, this is uh, a tool you can use. It's easy. We look at size mismatch. We look at age mismatch. Sometimes we do actually the living donor uh, KDPI as well to see what's the best donor for that recipient and vice versa. And as I said, if there is any time constraints, um, we keep reevaluating things. It's a dynamic process. If there's time constraints, we remove those if no matching, uh, we keep doing the matching. It comes to about three months. We remove those uh, compatible uh, pairs from the KPD program and we proceed with direct uh, donation. Again, our intention uh, here is to offer the bet better kidneys to the recipient. So we look at all the recipients. We don't actually give a bad kidney or a or an old kidney to a younger recipient, unless there is really, really need, uh, for example, highly sensitized, someone who's 100% sensitized. Uh, so the intention here is to offer better kidneys and to have all the pairs benefit from KPD. So after all, this is the reason why they were enrolled in KPD program is to score better kidneys. Uh, if we cannot offer them a better kidney, then we recommend to, to go with transplant with the original uh, donor. In conclusion, all potential living kidney donors and recipients should be informed about KPD early in the educational process, even prior to compatibility testing. And actually what I found uh, practical is educating the living donors. The recipients are typically very desperate. They just want a kidney. Of course, they would like to have a kidney from a loved one, but the living donors are the one who actually uh, have to be convinced that if they uh, do KPD or get enrolled in KPD, they help more people. Uh, the recipient may get actually a better kidney than theirs. So that's, that's my actually uh, experience, a practical experience that potential living kidney donors are the one who needs to be educated. And even actually we talk to them about it even before I know if they're ABO compatible or not. So we foster that very early in the process and it's very important to the success of the KPT program. Extending eligibility to compatible pairs, I hope I, I convinced you that uh, even if you have a small program, if you actually uh, expand it to in involve compatible pairs, you can actually increase your numbers, your uh, transplant numbers, address uh, organ shortage, and also benefit the recipients of those compatible pairs. 
um, and uh, the intent is to match them with better donors for them. So that's our experience. Uh, I'm open to questions. It's uh, one, one fifty p.m. here in uh, our time, so we have ten minutes, and I'll be happy to entertain uh, any question. Thank you so much for your attention. Dr. Rizzo, thank you very much. Uh, very clear everything. And, you know, it's amazing how you increase your pool for a key pro, uh, program doing this uh, ABO uh, compatibles. Mm -hmm. uh, a few questions. Um, sure. The algorithm. Yep. Um, is this a special software that you can buy or you have the chance to change uh, somehow? That's a good question. When the KPD program started, you know, five, uh, like five, six years ago, we used to do things manual with the help of the HLA lab. I mean, we had a smaller, uh, smaller number of uh, pairs. So uh, with the help of the HLA personnel, uh, typically the head of the HLA lab, uh, who's, uh, um, who's very needs to be invested in fishing for better matches and our coordinator used to do it manually. Until about, I think five, six years ago, we uh, started to match doing random match uh, through uh, the HLA lab software called Histotrack. And recently we purchased uh, a software. It's actually very, very efficient, similar to how NKR they do their matches. Uh, it's called Match Grid. It's not very expensive, actually. We looked into it. It's cost, uh, I told you recently, it's about $5,000. Mm -hmm. And there is a maintenance fee every year. I mean, $5,000 in the US is not a big sum. I know for certain countries, maybe a big sum of money, but it's not compared to the benefit. And, uh, you know, you just with a click, if you have all the information, all the pairs, their HLA, their uh, age and everything, it, it gives you a lot of configurations, actually. So each time we have a pair that is approved and they consented, we actually, I forgot to say that we have to have the written consent to, uh, for those pairs to actually enroll them in KPD. So once we have that, the coordinator put their information, run, keep running the match actually almost every day. And that's how you, you start, you know, doing and be efficient and doing so many transplants. Thank you. There's a question about uh, the families. Um, I understand you, their families are not allowed to meet each, each other, right? Well, uh, you, not yeah. before that, not before the transplant. After the transplant, we allow them. Um, we allow them to meet each other if they would like. Uh, we encourage them to exchange letters, letters of thank you. And actually a lot of them uh, would like to meet. Uh, yesterday I had, uh, I had a recipient who had uh, his kidney through the pair. His wife donated on his behalf to another pair, and they became so much friends with the other uh, with the other couple. And he was telling me they do things together, and you know, uh, so yeah, they become friends. Actually, we allow it. Uh, we allow it when the transplant happens and it's done. Um, actually, it's, uh, if we do just a, a two-way exchange, a lot of times they discover that on the floor and they ask us if they can meet each other. Once the transplant is done and they're willing to do it, we allow them to meet each other. What do you mean about size mismatch? I mean, mm -hmm. how, how, how That's a good question. Yeah, the size uh, that's actually an excellent question because what we do actually in every donor here at Mayo Clinic, we don't only do creatinine clearance, we do a measure GFR through IFLM8 clearance. So for the size mismatch, we actually get that donor uh, uh, uncorrected GFR. Let's say the donor GFR is 100 mm -hmm. or 90. Let's say it's 100 for better uh, calculation. We divide it by two. So it's 50 because, you know, you assume that that kidney contribute 50% of the total GFR. And then we, uh, we bring the recipient, the potential recipient, we look at the surface area of the recipient and then we correct that GFR to the recipient, uh, uh, recipient surface area. If the GFR is less than 35, 
we don't uh, we don't uh, do the transplant. We aim to be actually higher than 35 or 40, roughly. So uh, that's how we do, that's how uh, we do size mismatch. Sometimes we do a rough idea as well. If you have a taller uh, taller person, young person who's uh, one meter and 80 centimeter uh, tall and you're giving them a small kidney from a shorter uh, lady, uh, you know, you know, roughly sometimes we have that, but uh, sometimes you also do the, uh, the IOTHLMA GFR clearance and we correct it to the recipient and make sure, you know, we're not disadvantaging that, uh, that recipient if we give them a kidney that's not good for them and their surface area. Good question. And one last one, I guess, um, about the running. How it works? Do you do a, a running every, every week, every month? Uh, uh, running the match? Yeah. Actually, we do it every day. Every day. Each time, yeah. Each time we have, uh, because we're very active, uh, you know, the three transplant coordinators in the three sites, and that's extremely important that they talk to each other. Whenever they have a new pair, uh, we put them in KPD and we run the match every time. Now, every day, uh, I know m my coordinator, actually, she sits just across the hall from me. She's running the match con continuously. And also we contribute to NKR as well. Uh, and also we put pairs there. Uh, they run the match for us. They do it actually also efficiently almost every, uh, every day or every other day. So for us, each time we put a pair, sometimes I see her putting pairs who did not consent for KPD just to see if there is any potential to help and then we approach that pair when they come for their evaluation or re-evaluation. We tell them, you know, uh, especially if it's an O donor. O donor is very, very important. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. in our experience, and one O donor can actually trigger uh, six to seven transplants. So the O donor, if you have an AB recipient and they have an O donor, uh, why not, you know, telling them uh, your gift will be multiplied by six or seven? You know, I know it's hard culturally sometimes, especially in, in, uh, in uh, recipients and donors who are biologically related, it's hard to convince people, but why not, you know, trying. Uh, some of them say, no, we respect that. Some of them actually start to think about it. And as I said, a lot of time, actually, before yeah. I bring it, the yeah. KPD, yeah. before I bring yeah. Yeah. up the KPD yeah. option, yeah. I hear about it from the donor or the recipient. They tell, we're interested in KPD, even if we're matching. So, uh, so it's, it's a culture. It becomes, you know, something that we do every day, something that we educate patients and pairs about uh, during all the phases of the evaluation. It's very, very important. Education is very, very important. We have flyers as well. I um, can share. I don't have one here. Uh, but we have flyers of the KPD program. Uh, it's very simple, like what I showed you with the two-way exchange, so they understand what it is. Um, so that's very important, some educational uh, materials to them to understand. And, you know, here in the U.S., whenever there is actually a long chain, you see it on TV, you see it on CNN, 16 transplant. Mm -hmm. I mean, NKR was involved in 65 transplants. We were part of that. Actually, our uh, non-directed donors started that chain. So when people see it on TV as well, uh, you need as well the, the help of the media as well to, to talk about it and they become interested, you know, you'll be surprised. When the software gives you like this change very, very long pairs, um, next step is what? Doing the cross match, right? Yes. So the yeah. first step we do, we do a pre-select, yes. For example, we get offered uh, a kidney, let's say through NKR. Uh, a kidney for one of our recipients. Uh, once we, uh, they, they actually send us the donor information, mostly, you know, the age, uh, the GFR, uh, how big is the donor, uh, weight and height and all this. And we do a pre, we call it a pre-select yes. And then if all the centers where there is a chain agreed, then uh, they do a centralized cross match for NKR. Here at Mayo, each site uh, does the, the cross match in each site. So we ship to Florida and we ship actually blood to Florida and vice versa. Uh, sometimes actually we have donors who come from Florida 
to donate here uh, if the recipient lives close by to Minnesota and they live, let's say, in Georgia, which is closer to Florida, and they say, you know what, we'll, uh, we'll travel to Minnesota. To, they, get, they get evaluated in Florida, so not in Minnesota, and they travel to do, to do the donation here. So, so we have, uh, we're very flexible. We're very, and we try to avoid shipping kidneys. For those uh, pairs that we, the compatible pairs, we try our best not to uh, get them a kidney uh, that travel a lot. So we try mostly to match them in our, uh, let's say they're in Minnesota, we try to keep them in Minnesota. Uh, so we don't disadvantage them or have any problem on the route for that kidney, you know, the kidney get lost or the kidney get injured or something like that on the route. So many when, factors uh, play. When these long chains break some, somehow for some reason, um, that patient that was supposed to receive a kidney, uh, do they have the patient yeah. a special consideration on the right. list or something? Yeah, NKR has a way to give them um, give them a, a donor, a bridge donor. So we wait till we have another bridge donor from other chains. We do the same thing. The other thing that we can do here as well, we have, as I said, about 15, on average, 15 non-directed donors. We may actually, because uh, as a center, we can designate who, who's the non-directed donor go to. We can repair the chain or give them a donor from a non-directed donor. Unfortunately, we cannot put them higher on the waiting list for deceased donor because uh, this is not legal in the US to, to put someone above others. Uh, as a center. Now, it is very important when we educate them and they go through the consent. It's actually a few pages of consent. It's about five pages, very detailed. Talk about everything. Talk that it's not guaranteed. There may be a problem with the kidney when it's shipped. Uh, the transplant may not happen. So they're really very well informed. This is why some people back off and say, we don't want to do it. It's not guaranteed. So it's a, it's a double-edged sword, of course, but very rarely those things happen, very rarely. If you plan everything and you trust your other partners and other centers, uh, you know, the good thing, you know, our surgeons talk to each other as well. If they procure a kidney that has small vessels or like short vessels, they talk to each other and they know sometimes the kidney get decapsulated or so. So they talk to each other and they know what to expect, which is very, very important communication among the three centers or among the centers themselves. Actually, a lot of times we give them a call, they give them give us a call if they have any issue or the, any problem. Yeah. Well, I think that's all the questions we have in the chat and someone by my own. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Issa. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Gracias. Okay. Hope to see you soon. Uh, gracias, oh. Nofi, por el apoyo. Oh. Eh, gracias a todos por, esta, por aceptar esta invitación. Creo que pues, este programa de Durante Pareado debemos eh, trabajarlo, así como ellos trabajan en tres centros. Eh, de alguna forma podríamos eh, trabajar en algunos centros en, en, en Colombia. Gracias. gracias a todos. Bye bye.